Don't forget to like and subscribe. Welcome back to the MIA with CBDC Asset Group. Thank you for being a part of the group. Okay, we just wrapped up this XRPL conference out here in Miami. I just want to let you guys know everything was amazing. We learned so much about the XRPL community and continue to advance our knowledge in this space. And I just want to say to anybody who is interested or ever considered joining one of these conferences, the wealth of knowledge that you receive is amazing. And people are amazing as well. And uh, Miami is an amazing place to learn about the XRPL and the crypto community space. A lot of things are happening here everywhere you go you walk down the street you see random people spray painted to the moon everywhere you see board eight advertisements at bus stops the mayor of miami is talking about receiving his retirement package in crypto this is the greatest wealth transfer in the history of the world and anybody who didn't participate is going to be kicking themselves in the future. and i implore all of you who might not know or be scared or think it's too volatile Invest a little bit of money, watch it, and see what it does. Because my advice can only go so far. And once you put your dollars where your mouth is, then you'll tend to be more focused and, and want to learn a little bit. I want to give a shout out to all my coworkers who thought crypto was a joke. Who's laughing now? When we moon, you'll understand. I told you, get right or get left. It's your choice. Had a great time, and I just want to give a shout out to Chip on the chain and Ripple and everybody for putting this thing together. It was amazing. All right, with my I told you so's out of the way, let's get into the meat of the video. But the XRP Ledger is a uh, decentralized uh, project, and any changes that have to be made to the ledger require to go through what's called an amendment process, which requires voting by the nodes on the network. What I've got here is a uh, site, so if you go to livenet.xrpl.org, uh, you can see this is the actual ledger going by. by. Each one of these columns is a block on the ledger, and each one of those colored dots along the top there represents a transaction. Different colors represent different transactions on the ledger. So unlike some blockchains that just involve payments, and making payments from one to another, the XRP ledger has a number of additional transaction types. So it's got built into it a decentralized exchange. So you might be familiar with centralized exchanges like Coinbase or Kraken or Bitstamp or whatever, in which you have to set up an account on there, uh, send funds there, and then you can transact between fiat currencies, cryptocurrencies, different cryptocurrencies, etc. The XRP Ledger has what's called a decentralized exchange built in, and that's an exchange that actually runs collectively across all the nodes on the network on the blockchain. And you can actually make a, an offer on the ledger. So the blue dots that are on there are what are called offer creates transactions. And so that's somebody saying, hey, I will sell 100 XRP for $80 or whatever it is, $85. And for what, uh, so you can place an offer on there and other people could place offers to buy that off of you, right? So it works very similar to if you've ever traded on somewhere like Coinbase or Coin Coinbase Pro specifically or Kraken or something like that. Um, you will know that you will put in a, a, an offer and you say, okay, I'm looking to buy at this price. I'm looking to buy 100 XRP or you know, a tenth of a Bitcoin or whatever it is at, at this particular price. So that's, a, that's a, a, just a kind of a view of the XRP ledger. The dots along the bottom, by the way, are the validator nodes and their validations. And so you probably can't see, but just in the, the red background there, um, it says there, you know, 34 out of 34, or 33 out of 34. That's the nodes voting, so that says it receives 34 validations uh, for those transactions. So that's just a kind of a, a, a little view there of what's going on. Some of the features of the XRP ledger, which make it you know, really quite good for, for, for payments and, and processing transactions, it's very cheap. The transactions are, are very, very small. Now you might have heard a little bit about what's going on at the moment with the fees have escalated on the, the XRP ledger. So the XRP ledger, the fee mechanism, is designed to escalate in order to protect the network from load. And what's happened is there's been a, a sudden spike in load, the fees have gone up. Um, there's a little bit of bits and pieces that people are working on to try and work out, because it's gone up, it's not quite gone up how it should have done. But to put this in perspective, uh, the price of a transaction has gone from 10 drops, that's 10 millions of an XRP, up to around about 5,000 drops. Now that seems quite big, but that's still that's 5,000 
one millionth of an XRP. Um, and I should have worked this out in my head beforehand, but we're still talking <laughs> a, a thousandth of a dollar or something like that. I can't remember what it is. You know, somebody tweeted you can do still you know, 50,000 transactions for a dollar. So when we say the fees have gone up, um, you know, that's, that's relative. You know, we're not into uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum territory here where you're spending $50 for a transaction on a good day. Uh, it's fast. Transactions take about three to four seconds to process. And the transaction, the processing is deterministic. So with something like Ethereum or Bitcoin, when you, when you make a transaction, it's probabilistically settled, which means that a transaction goes through, you then have to wait for a certain number of confirmations to ensure that that transaction has gone through. And different blockchains have a different number of confirmations before people kind of deem it is, it is uh, a valid transaction. So with Bitcoin, it might be about an hour it takes. With uh, Ethereum, it might be something like about 15 minutes to half an hour. With the XRP ledger, it's three seconds. So transactions go through very quickly. So if you make a payment to, to, to somebody, it's there in three or four seconds. And it's liquid. XRP, the cryptocurrency, is traded on a large number of exchanges worldwide uh, with a large number of fiat pairings. That number is probably a little bit out of date now, but there's a large number of uh, uh, local fiat currencies around the world, which means it's really good for kind of global payments as well. So that's a little bit about the XRP ledger, and hopefully sort of bringing everybody just up to the, the, the level of what the XRP ledger is. This is a slide, there's a, a gentleman called Stedas um, on, uh, on Twitter, uh, his details are at Stedas there. He does a fantastic range of infographics. Now this one's a little bit old, I think this is a few years old, this might be 2019 I think possibly. Uh, so this is a little bit out of date, uh, but it gives you an idea of a lot of the ecosystem around the XRP ledger and the various different companies and projects using it. Um, I'm hoping that we can try and get, uh, see if we can commission status to make an updated one because like I said a lot of that will have changed. But the point I thought I'd put up with this is there's a lot of companies using the XRP ledger in various different ways. And like I said, that's, there's probably twice as many now as what's on that slide, I would say. There's been a lot of developments, a lot of projects on there. But really today what I wanted to talk about is what can you do with the XRP ledger? The idea of these meetups is to inspire people, connect people that want to build things um, on, on the XRP ledger. Build businesses, build services, build products, whatever it might be on the XRP ledger. So, I sat down and I had to try to break down the different ways in which somebody might want to get involved. Now, this is my thinking over a couple of hours uh, earlier this morning, kind of working this out, last night working this out. So this is by no means extensive, and we're gonna come back to this slide at the end, because what I would like everybody to do is, after this, is to kind of think about how you relate to this. I'm gonna leave this slide up at the end. Uh, kind of how you personally relate to this, or if there's something else that's not on here. And like I said, I've most likely missed stuff on here. But let's have a, a couple of examples. So, a core blockchain developer. So, the actual code that runs the ledger itself. It's written in C++, and if you are a C++ developer, or want to get into C++ development, there's an area there that you can work on. That's at kind of the very lowest layer of the blockchain, and get involved in the actual code that runs the network itself. Kind of moving up a layer, uh, tool developers, looking at the tools that access the XRP ledger. Now there's a number of different uh, SDKs, software development kits, written in different languages. So there's XRPLJS for JavaScript, there's XRPLPy for Python, there's one called XRPL4J for Java as well. And people might want to get involved in maintaining, building, extending, tooling around the XRP ledger, right? So you might say, okay, uh, I'm really interested in a particular programming language, Golang, Rust, maybe something that's not represented on there at the moment, and you want to get involved in that, or you want to get involved in uh, some of those projects that are, that are already there. Another area you can get involved with is a, as an infrastructure operator. So running a node on the network. The network's permissionless, it's decentralized, anybody can run a node on the XRP ledger. However, it does take a little bit of skill, a little bit of experience to do so, and what is 
most beneficial for the ledger as a whole is a number of well-run nodes, not a gazillion nodes that are, that are run kind of on a part-time basis. But if you're interested in running a node on the XRP ledger, maybe you have a business that uses the XRP ledger. So maybe you're creating a wallet or an exchange or a trading desk or something like that that interacts with the XRP ledger. Then I would encourage you to run your own node. Because if you run your own node, you're not dependent upon anybody else for how you access the ledger. You're actually a part of the network directly. You could use the XRP ledger to issue fun, what are called fungible tokens. That's tokens that can be exchanged, and one token is the same as any other. So something like US dollars, uh, gold, um, XR Doge. Uh, there's a, a, a Dogecoin uh, kind of clone running on the XRP ledger, for example. There's been a, a huge, great big spike in meme coins on the XRP ledger. Love them or loathe them, they're, they're here. The XRP ledger is a, is a like I said, it's a permissionless network. Anybody can do it, right? So um, there we go. And if you're going to, then please refer to my previous point about infrastructure. And please, you know, if you're going to be doing that, then it's be great to be running a node. There's a company called Sologenic, and they are they run a interface to the decentralized exchange. If you go to sologenic.org, they run an interface to the DEX. They're also working on a way to tokenize stocks and shares. So if you want to buy a, uh, a tenth of a share in Apple, something like that, you can actually do that on their site. It's still in beta at the moment. They're still working on their regulatory, um, getting their licenses to, to custody those, those stocks and shares. But that's something that could be uh, done on there, for example. Issue NFTs, non-fungible tokens. Uh, big boom at the moment going on in crypto space is non-fungible tokens. A lot of it around art and uh, things like collectibles. And uh, Jebsy from the X Rooms project is going to be talking a little bit about um, them. There's a project called Clever Gallery um, that's also like a gallery that's being uh, set up at the moment uh, by Joseph Choki. That's right, that is right, isn't it? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yo, yo, yeah. Um, uh, who has created this thing called Clever Gallery that he's working on? Uh, there's a gallery for NFTs. Payment applications. This is what the XRP ledger is traditionally known for, is for the global payments. Ripple use XRP in order to send payments internationally uh, cross-border. So that's what, what, what we work on. Uh, there's also companies like XRPL Labs that make the SUM wallet, X-U-M-M, uh, pronounced SUM, and is in the sum of all things. And uh, you know they create the SUM wallet, you can also, within some, create what are called X apps, the little apps that run within some to do certain things. So, some's a really great way of accessing the XRP ledger, and people can create payment applications, wallets, uh, things like that. Integrating XRP ledger with other blockchains, interconnectivity. So, there's a, a blockchain called WanChain, and they've created a bridge from the XRP ledger to WanChain and from XRP ledger to Ethereum. Uh, you might have heard recently that there's a uh, wrapped, a company called Wrapped.com are creating Wrapped XRP. That's XRP on the Ethereum blockchain as well. So uh, there's companies like Carver that do uh, an ability to stake XRP to get returns. You can put it in a, in a basically a uh, automated market, automatic market maker pool and get returns on your XRP. Uh, currently, I think it's about a 180% APY return on there. Uh, Flare, you've possibly heard of as well. Flare is a, is a new blockchain that's being created at the moment, and Flare um, allows people to connect Flare to uh, a lot of other blockchains they're working on. One of them is the XRP Ledger, and to be able to use XRP within the Flare ecosystem as well, which is pretty cool. And things like algorithmic trading tools and bots. This is actually how I got into XRP. Um, I started actually just just for uh, kind of just for fun actually as a programming exercise. I was between uh, jobs, and uh, as a programming exercise, I wrote uh, algorithmic trading bot. I thought maybe I could write some, something that trades backwards and forwards on the XRP ledger. Um, lo and behold, I actually started making money. Uh, this is 2017. So I was like, okay, that's, that's quite cool. So, but people can uh, create things that actually trade on the XRP ledger. Uh, I can't uh, no, that was in JavaScript actually, because the Python bindings didn't exist. Um, but I might rewrite it in Python. Um, I have written some other bits and pieces in Python as well. 
So, so that's just a kind of a, a kind of overview of the different kind of things you could do with the XRP ledger. Like I said, I'm sure that's not a comprehensive list. I'm pretty sure there's people out here that have ideas and say, oh, why did you leave that off, Matt? Um, their YouTube channel is probably full of comments of people saying, you forgot that one. So, but what I want people to do is just kind of use this as a talking point and talk to people afterwards about it. So then the next bit is, is how to get help. Uh, there's different kind of forums for getting help here. Now, originally, when I kind of had this idea for this talk, I started having uh, the last slide, all those ways in which you can kind of build stuff on the XRP ledger down one side, and I had these forums and sites down the other, and I was kind of drawing lines between them. But it got a complete mess, so I pulled those out. Uh, but there's a number of different sites here, um, and forums and ways in which you can get involved and find help. So xrpl.org is the main one. That's got all the documentation about the XRP ledger, and also actually links to most of these that are below as well, so you can find them on there. Uh, GitHub, that's the uh, coding repository where a lot of the code for the XRP ledger is stored. So the XRP ledger foundation, that is a not-for-profit foundation that does a lot of stuff with the XRP ledger. Um, or XRP, uh, XRP LF, the XRP ledger foundation, have a GitHub organization. And within there, you will find a lot of the code for the XRP ledger as well. Uh, Mattermost, if you're going to be involved in running infrastructure, uh, Mattermost is a, is a channel where a lot of the infrastructure providers hang out on. It is kind of run by the XRP Ledger Foundation, um, sort of invite only, but if you're involved in running infrastructure, uh, that can be of interest. Uh, Discord, there's a Discord uh, link up, QR code for a Discord link. Uh, so there's the XRP Ledger uh, Community Discord channel. There's things like groups there for meetups, um, groups there for different programming languages. A lot of help there. Stack Overflow, again, that's a kind of a question and answer uh, session. If you go to stackoverflow.com, stackoverflow.org, I think it is, uh, one or two, um, and you can search there. If you type in XRP or XRPL, you can find some questions. You can ask questions if you've got uh, questions there about, especially um, on a technical nature. There's the meetups. So you're all here today. We're going to be running a number of series of these meetups here in Miami. Plus, like I say, around uh, other cities around the world. And there's Apex, which is the big developer conference. So that was held in Las Vegas uh, a couple of months ago and will be run next year as well. We're not sure where yet. It was actually run in Vegas and in Tallinn, Estonia, in two different places simultaneously and streamed online. So it's quite a, quite a big thing going on there. Right. So that's kind of the area for kind of the forums and sites. You can also get funding if you're looking for building things as well. There's various ways to get funding. So the XRP Ledger Grants program, if you go to xrplgrants.org, you can look there and get uh, funding. So we've just closed wave two. So that's run by Ripple. We've just closed wave two of that. And we'll be opening wave three in the new year at some point for people who want funding for projects um, as part of the XRP Ledger. Uh, there's the Ripple NFT Creator Fund. So if you are a, um, uh, a content creator looking for, for funding there, that might be something you can apply to. And there's another project called Grant for the Web. It's actually run by a company called Coil, and uh, Coil and Rosilla, I believe it is. And so Grant for the Web is a project around content creators and web monetization. So one of the ways in which XRP is used, so it's a company called Coil, they have the system uh, as part of a, a system called Interledger that allows you to basically stream payment directly. So whilst you are looking at a web page, your browser is, is sending payment directly to the content creator. You know, one cent every second you're watching the, the content or, or whatever it is. And so they've got a fund there for content creators looking at new ways of monetizing content. So getting rid of adverts, what are the other ways in which content can be monetized? So that's it about, like I said, ways in which you can get involved in the XRP ledger and kind of funding around the XRP ledger. So now, I'd like to invite Jepsy up to come and have a, say a few words about a uh, project he's working on. So this is an example of somebody who's building on the XRP ledger. Um, I'm building something that's, I guess, kind of non-traditional to what XRP ledger is typically known for, which is payments. So, come on, come on Jepsy.
Uh, so my name is Jebzy, or Jesse is my artist name. And essentially my project is an XRP legend NFT based project. And pretty much, I don't know how many of you have seen this NFT boom going on right now with all the profile pictures and everything. Um, so pretty much it's based on that. Um, but with Vine, I can even offer a little bit more utility and whatnot, so I'll dive deeper into that. Um, so yeah, and the proof of ownership is stored directly on the ledger, so there's no issues with the whole centralization of other blockchains in that instance and going on OpenSea. So we could dive a little bit more into that. Um, so these couple things is why I chose the XRP ledger uh, for my project. And first thing is speed. As Matt mentioned before, um, speed is a big part of it. So essentially, we're in 2021. Um, we don't like to wait for things. So you like to know when things happen right away. So with other blockchains, you kind of have to wait hours, et cetera, um, kind of what you dove in before. And developers, to that extent, when you're testing applications, um, you want to know that your app works right away. So that's where any developers that are helping me with my project, um, they can literally test it that night and even get results back to me the very next day. Um, whereas if you're running into issues with coding, blah, 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 then you're going to wait for that settlement. Um, so the next part is cost. Cost is another massive key. Um, gas fees, nobody likes gas fees. Uh, with that being said, I, I test, texted a bunch of my buddies, have you guys gotten into NFTs? This was months and months back. And um, they all said no, but the, or I looked at it, but the gas fees deterred me away. So I just can't see something from a general public point of view, how they, when we're trying to incorporate the whole everybody and moving into this new decentralized aspect, um, how something like that is going to deter somebody away. Um, so going into that, um, myself too, if I'm doing collections, um, if you're doing a $10,000 10, $10, piece collection, um, that, that's going to add up over time with each piece. And then on top of that, uh, everything with XRP Ledger is layer one, which I, I love. So everything sticks on the layer one. Other protocols have layer two solutions built on top of that. Um, I'm pretty minimalist, so I like to keep things straight forward. So when you, I don't find it necessary to bring on other things when you could pretty much scale out a layer one in that instance. And with that being said, uh, I've seen, which I fully love, um, the gasless minting. I like the idea of it, but to go into that extent, I don't want to buy like fan paying the mint fee that I would have been paying in the beginning. So ultimately, the, the cost pretty much erases all of that for the most part. And then going into that transaction. So when you're transacting on the marketplace, people can buy, sell, etc., and you still don't need to worry about that gas fee. Um, that in collaboration is a big part of why I love the ledger as well. Um, there's so many different artists, and everybody's in it to, to just be friendly to each other. Um, you see on other chains, they're kind of almost battling with projects. Um, so if myself, we're all in it to help each other, and that's where it got me into utility. Um, one of my partners, Combat Kangas, they're actually designing a video game on the XRP ledger. So a game. So for example, if you own one of my NFTs, you can redeem a perk inside of their game for like uh, a folk mind uh, mushroom. So it's a mushroom power, essentially. So that shows how my utility, I like to use the example, because people know Call of Duty. Don't quote me on this, I'm not working with Call of Duty, but if you own one of my Xtreme's NFTs, you can quote unquote get a skin in the game, get a custom camouflage, and that's all about what people playing these games like. They like to personalize their, their uh, gameplay. Uh, going down into that, also another clever gallery, as Matt mentioned before, um, that's another part of I'm premiering my uh, Xtreme's art on his clever gallery, so it's essentially it's going to be live on opening day pending the new proposal on the ledger. Um, are, the, are you going to be talking about XLS 20? I, I can do just a bit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So essentially, there's a new proposal coming on the ledger that's going to make it more beneficial for everybody. So that's why the minting for myself is waiting a little bit. Um, but ultimately, the collaboration is, is amazing on the ledger, and everybody's in it to win. Going on to the community side, supportive. Everybody, they're super knowledgeable, so people like to dive in, actually do the research and that, and then going on to the dedicate dedicated powerful dedication sorry about that um, so powerful um, the other day Matt mentioned how the transaction fees kind of went a little bit up um, that very night every like developers got into a space and me as an artist I don't understand coding like that so they got into a space discussed the issue 
and it just gave us comfort, anybody building a project on the ledger. And then with that, to that extent, the very next day, Zoom, like apps that you interact with on the ledger, they, they have the new update. So they had an update coming out that night, pause the update, fix it, and fix everything that night. Um, so to me, that's a truly powerful stuff, how people got together and shows the, the decentralized aspect of it, and it was fixed the very next day. Essentially, you gave this to a company, and you're going through months and months of like waiting to, to go into that aspect. So the fact that the community is very strong and they like to fix things um, is pretty powerful, and that helped my project grow. Um, so pretty much it's based on that, um, but with Vine, I can even offer a little bit more utility and whatnot, so I'll dive deeper into that. Um, so yeah, and the proof of ownership is stored directly on the ledger, so there's no issues with the whole centralization of other blockchains in that instance and going on OpenSea. So we could dive a little bit more into that. Um, so these couple things is why I chose the XRP ledger uh, for my project. And first thing is speed. As Matt mentioned before, um, speed is a big part of it. So essentially, we're in 2021. Um, we don't like to wait for things. So you like to know when things happen right away. So with other blockchains, you kind of have to wait hours, etc. cetera, um, kind of what you dove in before. And developers, to that extent, when you're testing applications, um, you want to know that your app works right away. So that's where any developers that are helping me with my project, um, they can literally test it that night and even get results back to me the very next day. Um, whereas if you're running into issues with coding, blah, 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 then you're going to wait for that settlement. Um, so the next part is cost. Cost is another massive key. Um, gas fees, nobody likes gas fees. Uh, with that being said, I, I test, texted a bunch of my buddies, have you guys gotten into NFTs? This was months and months back. And um, they all said no, but the, or I looked at it, but the gas fees deterred me away. So I just can't see something from a general public point of view, how they, can, when we're trying to incorporate the whole, everybody, and moving into this new decentralized aspect, um, how something like that is going to deter somebody away. Um, so going into that, um, myself too, if I'm doing collections, um, if you're doing a $10,000 10, $10, piece collection, um, that, that's going to add up over time with each piece. And then on top of that, uh, everything with XRP Ledger is layer one, which I, I love. So everything sticks on the layer one. Other protocols have layer two solutions built on top of that. Um, I'm pretty minimalist, so I like to keep things straightforward. So when you, I don't find it necessary to bring on other things when you could pretty much scale out a layer one in that instance. And with that being said, uh, I've seen, which I fully love, um, the gas is minting. I like the idea of it, but to go into that extent, I don't want to buy like fan paying the mint fee that I would have been paying in the beginning. So ultimately, the, the cost pretty much erases all that for the most part. And then going into that transaction. So when you're transacting on the marketplace, people can buy, sell, etc., and you still don't need to worry about that gas fee. Um, diving in collaboration is a big part of why I love the ledger as well. Um, there's so many different artists, and everybody's in it to, to just be friendly to each other. Um, you see on other chains, they're kind of almost battling with projects. Um, so if myself, we're all in it to help each other, and that's where diving into utility. Um, one of my partners, Combat Kangas, they're actually designing a video game on the XRP Ledger. So a game. So for example, if you own one of my NFTs, you can redeem a perk inside of their game for like a uh, Pokemon uh, mushroom. So it's a mushroom power, essentially. So that shows how my utility, I like to use the example, because people know Call of Duty. Don't quote me on this, I'm not working with Call of Duty, but if you own one of my x NFTs, you can quote unquote get a skin in the game, get a custom camouflage, and that's all about what people playing these games like. They like to personalize their, their uh, gameplay. Uh, going down into that, also another clever gallery, as Matt mentioned before, um, that's another part where I'm premiering my uh, x art on his clever gallery, so it's essentially it's going to be live on opening day pending the new proposal on the ledger. Um, are, the, are you going to be talking about XLS 20? I, I can do just a bit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So essentially, there's a new proposal coming on the ledger that's going to make it more beneficial for everybody. So that's why the minting for myself is waiting a little bit. Um, but ultimately, the collaboration is, is amazing on the ledger, and everybody's in it to win. Going on to the community side, supportive. Everybody, they're super knowledgeable, so people like to dive in. 
actually do the research in that, and then go on to the dedicate, dedicated, powerful, dedication, sorry about that, um, so powerful. Um, the other day, Matt mentioned how the transaction fees kind of went a little bit up. Um, that very night, every like developers got into a space, and me as an artist, I don't understand coding like that. So they got into a space, discussed the issue, and it just gave us comfort, anybody building a project on the ledger. And then with that, to that extent, the very next day, Zoom, like apps that you interact on the ledger, they, they had the new update. So they had an update coming out that night, pause the update, fix it, and fix everything that night. Um, so to me, that's a truly powerful stuff, how people got together and shows the, the decentralized aspect of it, and it was fixed the very next day. Essentially, you gave this to a company, and you're going through months and months of like waiting to, to go into that aspect. So the fact that the community is very strong and they like to fix things um, is pretty powerful, and that helps my project grow. Uh, so that, those are pretty much the four main points on why I'm doing my project on the ledger. I saw you had our hand raised up. Take questions? Yeah. Yeah. If you have a question? Just a quick one. Yeah, just wondering when you, uh, when an NFT gets resold, uh -huh. is there a capability that a portion can go back to the creator? Correct. Yeah, there's royalties. So incorporating the metadata of the, the image, um, you can incorporate royalties, whatever that may be. That's why I'm a huge fan of the Clever Galleries um, partnership that I have. It's not like any of uh, the Ethereum blockchain has OpenSea, that's the most prominent NFT marketplace. It, there's a lot of bad things going on. I don't want to talk negative about it, but essentially they can lock your metadata um, and there's, it's sort of centralized in that aspect. So there's movements going on outside of that. And that's why I'm a big fan of the XRP ledger. Um, nobody is locking my metadata in that instance. Um, so it, it's full power to the artist and the consumer in that aspect. So yeah, it's just, and it's taking out the middleman. And that's the whole point of web three as we're moving into that aspect. Uh, so yeah, as an artist, it's amazing for me, and it even helps out you guys. Yes? Is there a non fungible sort of standard on XRP yet? Correct. Yes, there is currently one. Um, it's just not as beneficial for the consumer and the artist. Um, so I don't know if you're familiar too much about trust lines. So essentially, you need to hold two XRP per trust line. That's like US dollar, BTC, Euro, so you can hold other assets on the XRP ledger. And that goes into the DEX, the decentralized exchange. Um, each, as it is right now, each NFT costs two trust lines to lock up. So I go to speaking, if somebody wanted to hold 30 NFTs, that's gonna lock up 60 XRP. With the new proposal coming on the ledger, it's gonna have token pages. Um, so essentially, you're not going to have to lock up 30, uh, 60 XRP. It's, you could allow up to 32 NFTs per page, which, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it locks up two XRP. I think so. So you can, for example, if you have 60 NFTs now, it's only going to lock you up four XRP compared to 60 times two, would be 120. So this, because XRP ledger was focused on the payments in the, the early stages of it, um, now it's going to scale out into other aspects, and that's why I love it because. It, incorporate more things as the ledger grows. And none of it's layer two. Oh, here, these are some of my custom mini <coughs> gifted next rooms for the Ripple team. So you see uh, Brad, Chris, Monica, David, Stuart, and this is actually Matt right here. And then Arthur Brito, the man in the face. <laughs> So essentially, outside of the 10K collection, I'm doing this little fun thing. I'm gifting anybody in the XRP community um, these NFTs. And what's pretty cool about the proposal, too, is that you can set a non-transferable um, lock on it. So essentially, the value won't affect the tens of supply and demand. So it's not going to increase my 10,000 supply. So it's going to just be gifted. So imagine I gifted Matt this NFT. He could either keep it or burn it and he won't be able to transact it with on the marketplace. That's specifically for the minted and gifted. And then a couple ones, for example, the Squid Games, like I call it Shroom Game. Those are gonna be inside the set as super rares. Um, there's a couple different DNAs that you see with that. We have Jet on the bottom right. I think Jet, Jet, up there, Jet yeah. is over there. So I had a podcast with them and gifted them uh, an extra as well. So this is kind of an idea. And it's all generated by code from the layers I create. So I create X amount, which can go from 50 to 100,000 combinations. 
and I only generate 10K, and then that's where rarity, et cetera, comes into play. Yeah, that's essentially, for the most part, it, and why I chose the XLP ledger for my project. So, as Gypsy mentioned, in that particular case, there's a standard called XLS20 that's being developed um, that is much more efficient for storing NFTs. Uh, that's currently kind of in development and it needs to be voted on in order to go live on the network. So it's, it's up to the community to kind of support that and the validators to vote on it for it to go ahead. So I'm just going to bring back this page. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to wrap up talking now. I'm going to leave this up. And so what I'd like you to do is chat to people here. Think about where you fit in that, if at all. If you fit into something else, great. You know. Talk about that, come let me know. If there's something out there um, that I've missed up, come let me know. Uh, but use that as kind of a talking point to think about kind of your involvement in the XRP ledger, what you might want to get out of it, what you might be able to build on it if you want to, or what you'd like to see built on it. You know, what would you like somebody else to build on it if you, uh, um, if you want to? So, <laughs> our goes up there. Yeah, build all the things. <laughs> Great. Okay, so I think that's uh, that's uh, yeah. what's the we got the space for one more hour. We got the space for one more hour. There's probably some more pizza, I think maybe. <laughs> one more hour. Pizza. 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 Pizza stores, the way it stores NFTs more efficiently is it stores them as, uh, it has these like NFT pages and each, each page, think of like a page of a book in which you can have multiple lines and each page can store up to, I think it's 32, is, uh, there is 30, 32 NFTs that then get stored as a single object on the XRP ledger. At the moment, NFTs are represented, as Jepsy said, as trust lines and so each one is a separate object. So if Jepsy goes and mints, 100,000 NFTs, and that's 100,000 individual objects on the XRP ledger. And if we have 100 Jepsies doing that, or 1,000 Jepsies doing that, then obviously that becomes a big issue, right? So XLS20, the idea behind that is by having these pages, it means it's more efficient to way of storing it. So you can store up to 32 in a single object on the ledger, which means it's just more efficient for the ledger to process as well. What do you think is going to be updates to happen? I, 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 I'd, I'd love to say, I don't know, um, most of the technical development of XLS20 has been done, uh, and it's, there's a, a dev net, a separate development network that can test it out on the building apes, but in order for it to go live, it has to be coded as what's called an amendment on the main network and people have to vote on it. That may take a while, it may take a number of months, and at the moment, there's, I mentioned before, a little bit of... Um, uh, work going on with kind of the, the stability and the scaling going on with the XRP ledger at the moment. So once that's finished, which I think should be done by the end of this year, hopefully, um, then people start to concentrate back on that. But the, the, at the moment, it's a case of the priority is um, just kind of sorting out the, this fee escalation issue. What's, what's happened in, in, in short condensing this down is the XRP ledger, when it gets overloaded, it increases the fees. And so what's happened is it's increased the fees, but that means that transactions that are coming with a lower fee are not getting into the ledger, they're getting put on a queue. Come on, man, berserker. Berserker. Itself is causing a large amount of load, which means that the fees are staying high. So it's kind of got itself stuck in a bit of a loop that's going on. And so uh, there's a, a number of people within both the community as well, like well, Richard Holland, who's been doing a lot of work, uh, Peter Wind, uh, Barra from the XRP Ledger Foundation, um, uh, who have been doing a lot of work in looking at the technical side of what's going on, as well as a number of engineers at Ripple as well, who've been looking at that, led by Nick Regalis um, at, at Ripple. So hopefully that should be fixed soon. But it's just like I say, it's just kind of got itself a little bit stuck in this in this fee level because it thinks there's a high load, so it's raised fees, which is kind of making it think there's still a high load. So it's kind of gotten a, in a bit of a yeah. So is it, oh, sorry. Is it like a like a bug that they're trying to fix, or, or how yes. would you identify an attack? Yeah, I, yes, potentially it's a bug. It's kind of the XRP ledger is doing what it is designed to do, which is to increase the fees when the load goes up. The problem, the, the, the kind of the bug bit of it is, it probably should have brought them down again by now. 
but it's kind of like stuck at this slightly high elevated fee level, and that's kind of caused a lot of people, you know, so a lot of people looking at it to see, okay, what exactly is going on here. Now, the XRP ledger is, is tested on like a synthetic network to test its performance and scalability, but it's very difficult to get a, like a test network to exactly replicate the full characteristics of a public global network. Some slow servers are slower than others, some are further away, some are more memory, some are less memory, some are faster, some are slower. It's very difficult to encapsulate that in a test to test all of these things. So in the synthetic test, everything's fine. In the real world scenario, there's something there that's not quite right. Now, there's a number of theories as to exactly what's going on, and uh, I think there's, a, there's probably going to be so uh, Ripple D, the software that runs the XRP Ledger, Ripple D 1.8.1 was released last week, and there's probably going to be a 1.8.2 coming up very soon, maybe next week or the week after, I'm guessing, um, that may contain a a fix for what we think is possibly causing this issue. And it's to do with, like I said, this queue gets very long, but each node's queue is slightly different and in a slightly different order. So each node says, okay, well, we'll take 10 transactions and put them in, but they're all taking slightly different 10 transactions. And what's happening is a consensus algorithm, which is intended to kind of say, okay, we're all looking at the same thing, is saying, well, wait a minute, we're not looking at the same thing here. We're each picking slightly different transactions to go through. The higher fee transactions are going through fine because they're always in front of the queue. But it's the ones that are slightly behind that. That's that's the theory, that's what we think is going on at the moment. And so um, there's a, a relatively, I think, trivial fix code-wise that basically involves sorting the queue. So that everybody takes, you know, if we take the first 10, we're all looking at the same 10. Um, although I say it's very trivial, it's always slightly, you know, when you go and put these changes in, like I said, you don't quite know exactly what the effect is going to be. So there's a lot of testing that needs to happen before the go. And can the ledger be attacked? It, it, can, it can be attacked, yes. Um, it, the, the question being is what would be the effect of that attack? I mean, at the moment, in some ways, it kind of looks like an attack that has been overloaded, a denial of service attack, that a lot of transactions are coming all at once, generally around... Um, there's a lot of meme tokens that have been generated and what are called trust line farmers that are creating a lot of trust lines. And this is a usage pattern that was never really envisaged at the start of the XRP ledger. Remember, the XRP ledger is nearly a decade old now. And so the original kind of assumptions for how people would use it 10 years ago are very different to how people are using it now. Right? So that's uh, what we think. Yeah. Um, more ledgers that like more nodes, I mean, more nodes. Would more nodes on the ledger alleviate that problem? No, probably not at this exact moment, and in some ways it may even make that worse, because what happens is every node has to agree on the current state, and so if you add more in, then you've got more that have to agree. And if the problem we're having at the moment is that with these transactions towards the end of the queue that we're not agreeing, then adding more nodes is not going to really help that, and if anything may make that slightly worse. Once we get this sorted out going forward, then yes, having some more nodes, especially people that run, um, you know, any in intensive operations, uh, then having your own node rather than relying on the nodes from say Ripple or the XRP Ledger Foundation would be would be a help as well. I have one more question. Just, just you see how Ethereum was changing over time, how it would become, you know, Ether and over. And the gas fees are just getting ridiculous over a period of amount. It's getting worse and worse. Yeah. And if that was going to keep uh, doing 2.0, would you ever see XRP hitting that type of uh, upgrade in the future? If so, it gets more complicated, more complex? Right, so the question is will the XRP ledger ever kind of hit the same uh, big scalability issues that Ethereum is having? Uh, no, I don't think so. It works a different way. Partly the problem with Ethereum is that. So one of the big differences between the XRP ledger and proof-of-work blockchains like Ethereum and, and Bitcoin, with the XRP ledger, those people that run nodes on the XRP ledger are not incentivized to do so. You don't generate income mm -hmm. just by running a node on the XRP ledger. The fees mm -hmm. for the transactions are burnt. They don't go to anybody. With Ethereum and Bitcoin, the fees go to the miners that run the infrastructure. Now, the big problem you've got on Ethereum is they brought out recently a standard, and there's a, um, a thing called uh, maximum extractable value that, that people do. But basically, if you, 
if you as an operator get fees for running the network, then it's in your interest for the fees to be high, because you're going to get more money. Whereas the users are going to want the fees to be low. So that's the problem with Ethereum at the moment, is that effectively the miners are trying to get it so that the fee value is as high as possible so they get the most money. And that puts them directly in odds to the users of the network. Whereas with the XRP ledger, there's a fantastic video if you've not seen it, if you look it up on YouTube by David Schwartz, a CTO of Ripple called uh, No Incentive is the Best Incentive. And basically that's the point. With the XRP ledger, nobody gets the fees. So there's no incentive for those fees to be high because it doesn't benefit anybody. So I don't think the XRP ledger would, would kind of get to that same kind of issue that Ethereum would have. It will evolve over time, and the XRP ledger has evolved over time. It's been this amendment process in which amendments can be voted on. There's been a number of amendments, it's been about 30 or so, I think off the top of my head, 20 or 30 amendments over time that have been voted on that bring about various functionality. So one of them will be the XMS20 standard um, that allows you know, NFTs to be stored more efficiently. One of them uh, hopefully will be, uh, there's a, a piece of functionality called books that allows kind of smart contract functionality on the XRP ledger. That's an amendment that could possibly come up in the next year. Uh, we go to So, yeah. Question, sorry. Thanks for the explanation. I was just wondering if you need to welcome to my first question. Yeah, thank you. I thought I'd bring it to you. Yeah. Um, did, did the, uh, this technical issue we have, Right, so did the, did the technical issue with the fees have an effect on the ODL liquidity product? Um, uh, oh yeah, they did have to raise the fees on it, yeah. So they did have to raise the fees in order, because any, if you're, any transaction going through it has to have a higher fee. So it's effective every, everybody, including Ripple themselves. So, you know, one of the things I've seen in the community, some people are saying, well, you know, why aren't Ripple engineers working on fixing this? Believe me, they are because it does affect Ripple just as it affects everybody else, that the fee level is higher. Now again, like I said, it's gone from 10 1 millionths of, a, of, a, of an XRP to say about five or 6,000 1 millionths of an XRP. So that's still, you know, you're we're still, spoiled. yeah, 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 we're spoiled. And, and I think this is the issue that's kind of slightly, slightly caught everybody on the hop, was that because the fees have been so low and around about 10 drops, so a lot of services have just hard coded that in and said, okay, every transaction is 10 drops. Now suddenly the ledger has increased the fees and everybody's gone, well, wait a minute, why are my transactions going through? I'm sending them through at 10 drops. And they're not even checking the ledger. And the ledger's saying, well, wait a minute, the fees are higher now, but they've hard-coded at 10 drops because that's been sufficient for so long now. Um, uh, and now that the fees have just gone up, that it's, uh, that it's not no longer sufficient. Yeah. Yeah, there were more, uh, more recently there were tests for like offline transactions. Can you talk right. a little bit about that? So, okay, so the thing, so offline transactions. So there was a thing that was demoed at Apex in Tallinn, Estonia, uh, by uh, Vito Wind and I think Barra, that was involved in Richard, Richard Holland from XRPL Labs. And that was a thing called XPOP, which is X uh, Proof of Payment. And that was the ability to prove that a transaction had been made uh, without having a connection to the internet directly. So the use case for this was you have a drinks machine or a coffee machine or something that, you, that, that, that accepts payment by XRP, right? You want to pay and you get your drink. Now typically that would involve that drinks machine having some software running on it and a network connection that means when you make the payment it can look on the ledger and say the payment has been made. <coughs> The XPOP allows that machine to validate that a transaction has been made without actually having a connection to the XRP ledger itself. Right? So it's able to actually um, verify the signature of the transaction. So what happens is when, when you make a payment from your phone and your phone makes a payment on the XRP ledger, uh, your phone then effectively signs that transaction in a way that the drinks machine can read it off of your phone via a QR code and then verify that yes, we can actually cryptographically check that, that we can be sure that that payment has been made. So without actually seeing the XRP ledger. It's like right. a reserved block. It's not even like a reserved block. It's kind of like, I don't know, I suppose, um, think about writing writing a check, right? If you write, if you write a check to me and give me a check, 
right? Um, as long as I know your signature and I can validate that your signature is correct, then I can be sure that that's a payment. And the analogy doesn't really quite work, but I can be sure that that's a valid payment, right? And I can go and cash that check, right? That, because that, that would be, that would, it seems like that would be open the door or be closed. That's why I, I assumed it was escrow or like some kind of like reserve. No, it's not, it's not a, a, an escrow. It, it includes something that prevents you from repeating it. But um, yeah, it's, it's just a way for you to be able to be given some proof that you can independently verify and say, yes, that was a transaction that was made on the ledger, right? So it's a, it's a signed bit of information that you can say, yes, it was, if I know if I can verify cryptographically that that was a transaction that was made on the ledger without going and looking at the ledger. So they have a redeemable. It's like they take it from, I guess, I was trying to work it out of my head, but I think I can. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I saw somewhere David had said something about a So one of the things that's coming up on the XRP ledger is AMMs, automatic market makers, right? So there is uh, an automatic market maker, you might have heard of Uniswap and various clones of that, uh, PancakeSwap and things like that that are, that are on various networks. So that's something that we're working on at Ripple to put on the XRP ledger as well. Um, I don't know the full details of it, but I know that it's got some additional kind of functionality on it above and beyond what things like Uniswap have. I don't know the full details of it yet. Uh, has got some benefits on that. No, it's, it's not being developed yet. Yeah, to, maybe towards the end of next year, potentially. But, yeah. Will that bring the abilities to like um, ability mining and liquidity mining? Will that give the ability to do liquidity mining and DeFi stuff on the XRP ledger? Yes, yes, it will do. So at the moment, there's a decentralized exchange on the XRP ledger. And you can run a market maker on there, but you have to kind of write the software to place offers and take them off and cancel them and put them at different levels, etc., etc. Whereas with a, an a automatic market maker, generally you take two tokens and you lock them up into a liquidity pool and it basically takes care of it all for you. And at the end of it, you can withdraw your share of the liquidity pool out. Um, so that's something that's going to be going on. That'll be running alongside the, the, the main decks as well. So you'll have, two, you'll, you'll have both ways in which you can interact and trade. And actually, the AMM will probably leverage some of the DEX functionality as well. Yeah, back. I've got a question for you about Rippling. So, I don't know if you've got a look at your site, but is Rippling able to add in the any liquidity on the DEX, or is that just for any liquidity, like open order of the world? How does that work? Right, so the question was about Rippling and what Rippling is. So. Rippling is a bit of functionality that originally, that goes back way, way, way before actually the XRP ledger was created or before Ripple created. So a, a very brief bit of history. There was a, an original project back from 2004, I think it was, um, called Ripple by a Canadian developer called Ryan Fugger, who uh, created a idea of a social credit system. And the idea was you would probably have informally done this with your friends. If you know one of you goes and buy lunch one day, then you kind of know that they, they might owe you a lunch and the next time that they pay, or you know, one person buys drinks this time, somebody else buys them the next time. And you kind of mentally have this kind of like you know mental balance roughly going on about kind of who owes who, right? So the original Ripple project, Ripple Pay, that was back way before Bitcoin even existed, was a credit system, what was called a social credit system, not social credit as in like what China are doing, uh, but social credit in the way in which uh, you can keep track of who owes what. And what the way it works is, is that if, say, uh, say I owe Chip $20 and I also owe Jeff $20, then basically I can, but basically, Chip can pay Jeff by basically saying, take some of the money that, that Matt owes me and pass it over so that Matt now Dang, who's that bald head gentleman right there up against the wall? Yeah, right there. There he is. Now, as you pay Jeff. All that's happening is we're adjusting, saying, okay, you owe, you know, Matt owes me a little bit less money and owes you a bit more money instead, right? And so that payment gets adjusted by adjusting the debt obligations. 
Those debt obligations are what are now represented in the XRP ledger as trust lines. That's what trust lines are. They're, they're debt, ways of tracking debt between a token issuer and yourself. So when you set up a trust line, and you set up a trust line for a million dollars to a gate hub for some US dollars, and what you're doing is you're saying that you trust GitHub to effectively owe you up to a million dollars worth of tokens that represent uh, dollars, right? Because if you think about it, if they, if you buy a thousand dollars worth of US dollar tokens on the XRP ledger, you're effectively saying you're trusting somebody to redeem those thousand dollars, those thousand tokens back to dollars again, right? So, and that's what the trust lines are. Now that existed in Ripple way before. The XRP ledger existed before Ripple, the company existed before Bitcoin existed. That's where Ripple comes from. That process of moving those debts around is what is called rippling. That's where the name came from. And then we ended up with, with what was originally called the Ripple Consensus Ledger, which became known, now known as the XRP ledger, and the company Ripple. You can understand why people get confused between Ripple, XRP, you know, it's, it's yes. If I had a time machine, I would probably go back and, and kick people and say, no, 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 don't, don't change the name, please. Um, so, yes, yeah, so that's where it all came from. So the, the question was about um, this, this process of rippling that does exist in the XRP ledger, and can it kind of work on the, on the decks and between different tokens? Is that what it was? Yeah. So, yes, it's still there. By default, it is disabled, because it, it's a re relatively advanced feature that you might not actually want to happen. So what could happen on the XRP ledger is, like I said, if, you, if you've got a trust line to two different issuers of a token, so say you've got a trust line to two different US dollar issuers, um, then a payment could come in and somebody pays you in one of them and the XRP ledger might actually ripple it over and substitute for the other one that you might not want to have happened. Right? And the, the idea is that in theory, one US dollar issues, one issue of US dollars should be the same as another, but of course it, they're, they're different because they're issued by different people, right? In the same way that uh, on, say, Ethereum, uh, Tether, USDT, is different to Circle, USDC. They're both US dollars, but they're issued by different companies, different organizations, and you know they've got different things backing them, they're set up in different companies, they're regulated in different ways, etc., etc., etc. So they are different. So if Rippling is disabled by default the XRP ledger for people because they can sometimes get into this scenario that they might not be expecting. But it's a really, really powerful feature, actually, and uh, you can do some quite, quite cool things with it. Uh, are you still using the, the bot to trade? Am I still using the bot to trade? Um, I, I was doing it. I stopped it when the fees went up. Um, but uh, no, I, I, I was running it in 20, uh, 2017, 2018, and then stopped it. Uh, that hasn't been running for years. Uh, I did start it up just recently, uh, but I've stopped it again now with the, with the fees going up. Um, but originally, it was making quite a bit of money, and uh, I was my, my thought was, well, I, I don't I don't need. I was between jobs, and I thought, well, I don't need a job. I can just let that make money, and I'll go and, like sit on a yacht at some point in the future. <laughs> uh, and then the market all crashed in December, in January, February, 2018. And, uh, my wife said, well, you better get a job, otherwise you'll just be sat on the sofa in your pants. Um, so. Uh, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's that's what happened to that. <laughs> but it's, it's it's still there. The code's still there. It still runs. So. Should do better next year. What's that? Should do better next year. Should do better next year. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Any other questions, or should we get on to? Just Jeff? mentioned a couple of stable points. Um, yep. Will Ore, which I think is Trustline. Trustline's Ore. Yeah, yeah. Matt Ross. Right? Yeah, yeah. And will that be the first stable uh, issued on the XRP? So, so there's a, a company called Trustline, uh, run by an, actually an ex-Rippler called uh, Matt Rosenden, who's created a stable coin called Aura. Um, there's, I mean, the thing being is, it depends on how you actually define stable coins, because you could actually say the XRP Ledger was the first network that had stable coins nearly a decade ago, because it allowed you to issue other currencies. So there's been US dollars, euros, Japanese yen, <coughs> Chinese won. There's been uh, all sorts of currencies on the XRP ledger. There's Ethereum, there's Bitcoin, there was gold, there was platinum at one point. So there's different issuers that have issued what we would now call stable coins on the XRP ledger. So Aura is probably the first algorithmic backed stable coin as far as I'm aware. And they're using, I think, Flare 
to be the kind of the trustless part in issuing back onto the XRP ledger. Um, I believe. I don't know the full details of it, but that's kind of what I understand. I think I have a clarifying question. Yeah. Um, so, where, what I understood, um, I think you told me this last night, you have RippleNet, you have XRP ledger. Right. Uh, RippleNet kind of helps handle the messaging for account balancing from one bank to another that's on RippleNet versus XRP ledger is the value sends. Right. And currently there's like 10 trillion USD of like currency locked up in different banks to help facilitate cross-border payments. And the value potentially for banks that use RippleNet, correct me if I'm wrong, is it that they would use XRP because now they don't know they don't have to hold foreign currencies on their balance sheets anymore. They can just use XRP to convert directly to any different currency. Yeah, yeah, right, correct. So so XRP, the XRP ledger, that's what we can talk about this evening. Uh, I work for Ripple. Ripple are a company that work with financial institutions. Ripple have a, a separate thing called RippleNet. Again, this is where the confusion comes in. So Ripple have a separate thing called RippleNet. It's completely separate to the XRP ledger. It's a commissioned uh, network for regulated financial institutions. Uh, and that's the kind of the 300 partners that Ripple have. They're using RippleNet. And they're generally moving fiat currencies around. But RippleNet can in turn use the XRP ledger, use XRP for a, using a product that Ripple had called ODL, on demand liquidity, was originally called XRapid. And so ODL is a system that means that if you're trying to send a payment from a, a bank in Thailand to a bank in Brazil, that the bank in Thailand uses Thai Baht to buy XRP on a local exchange. XRP is sent over to Brazil, and then the XRP is sold in Brazil for Brazilian real, and the Brazilian real is delivered to the end user. Now, that's the kind of the flow of the value over the XRP ledger, and then in parallel to that with RippleNet is the actual flow of the banking information, the KYC information between those two banks, right? So RippleNet will kind of do that bit, uh, but it will then instruct the XRP ledger and use the XRP ledger to actually transfer that value. And you're right, and the, the idea being is that if you don't use something like XRP to do that, the other way in which you do that, because RippleNet, Swift, all of these other systems for uh, cross-border payments, they're basically, they're messaging systems, right? So the bank in Thailand tells the bank in Brazil, here's a payment, but there's no currency that actually moves, right? So what has to happen is the bank in Thailand has to have parked in Brazil at that bank a bunch of Brazilian real in an account that's earmarked Okay, this Brazilian this account is owned by the bank in Thailand. So when the payment comes in, they just move some of the balance from the account owned by the bank in Thailand to the, the end user. Um, that's a system called Nostro and Vostro accounts, and that's how typically cross-border payments are done now. But as you say, yes, the problem with that being is that it involves basically parking large sums of money at the destination on the expectation that the transaction is going to come through. Now, if you're looking at payments going between London and New York, you, that's going to be a fairly constant flow backwards and forwards. There's going to be lots there. It's not going to be that much of a problem holding, you know, pounds sterling and US dollars at each end for each side because that's going backwards and forwards. But if you're trying to go through a more esoteric route, like, say, Thailand to Brazil, the chances are the bank in Thailand doesn't hold an account in the bank in Brazil. And if you think about it, are they going to, is that bank in Thailand going to hold a, a, a bank account in every single bank around the world? No, they're not. So what happens is that they use an intermediary and use what's called the correspondent banking system. That's where you get the extra charge on top. When you do a, 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 sometimes a cross-border payment, they'll say, well, there's an extra $20 charge for a correspondent fee or whatever it might be. And that's because what happened is the bank in Thailand has to contact a bank in New York and the bank in New York has an account with the bank in Brazil or whatever, right? and it kind of hops through a couple of banks. <coughs> yeah. um, and if you've seen, actually, the uh, Ripple produced a video recently, uh, the Ripple, uh, what they call the brand anthem, uh, and you kind of see it as a kind of a story running through of, of, of a guy kind of going back to his family, whatever. But there's one scene in that where you see somebody writing up on a whiteboard, and you see all the banks there, and you see it kind of like a direct line XRP, and that's the XRP can kind of miss out all those correspondent banks. That's the idea. From Ripple's use case, for, for, for example. How will this be used with businesses in the future? Let's say, like I, I understand that we're like at a level one, right? Yeah. Mostly institutions. So 
developers, but where does the average person fit into the XRP ledger in the future? Good question. I guess there's several different ways. At the moment, if you are um, a business and you're trying to make payments, then you are going to need probably a bank account to make those payments. And you're going to need a relationship with a bank in order to make those payments. Especially if they're international payments, right? Whereas with the XRP ledger, in theory, you don't need the bank and you can pay directly via, say, XRP between each other. You could do what Ripple's doing with ODL and you'll sell. They don't need to have their own nodes, um, but they could use the XRP ledger to make payments directly back to the with without needing a bank, right? And so that's one of the, the, the slight kind of like dichotomies of, of, of the XRP world is that the XRP ledger actually disintermediates banks in the financial industry because you can pay, you can go directly between each other. It's decentralized, you don't need a bank, right? Um, yet you've got a company like Ripple who are actually interfacing with banks and trying to get banks to use that system. And the reason why, at first this, this doesn't seem to make sense until you realize that small banks are customers of bigger banks. And so what's happening is, is the XRP ledger allows those smaller banks or businesses to transact with each other without having to use these larger <coughs> correspondent banks. So uh, in the future, I, I, I'm hoping that businesses will be able to basically transact with each other directly without needing to use that. Now there was a product um, uh, called a Settler, you might have seen. So there's a company called R3 that make a, a blockchain called Corda. There's a permission blockchain that's used within companies for like stock and stuff like that. And they created a thing called Settler that allows one company to settle a payment with another company using XRP. Right? So you imagine you've got two separate systems and two separate companies either side of the world. And what happens is one can raise an invoice and the other can then pay that invoice by sending XRP and it converts it at the current currency rate and sends it over. Good question. So the big thing with Square uh, is they made it very easy for merchants to transact, right? So they created like little, little wireless terminals that you can use. So beforehand you had to go to a bank, you got this big bulky thing, you paid a lot of money for it and whatever, whereas Square like, okay, we'll give you this little tiny thing that connects my Bluetooth to your phone and you can make payments, right? So is there a world for I think so. And there's companies, so people like the XRP, uh, XRPL Labs in the Netherlands, uh, they actually had a we had a meetup in the Netherlands about three years ago, and we were buying beer using, you know, some of the XRP ledger directly. So we were able to scan a barcode and, and buy beer. So, you know, I think there's definitely a future for that. Whether that's Ripple going to be involved in it, whether that's going to be somebody else, um, it's it's up for anybody to take basically. So. Matt, okay. there's a question from uh, online over here. Sure. Uh, from bullish Mr. K, he said, uh, let's move past the SEC ignorance. My question is, when we have clarity and the ecosystem has expanding utility, is there a combined group of developers ready for the next phase of expansion? Wow. He's, he's going he's to lead that? <laughs> yeah, oh, bullish, uh, oh, bullish, oh, uh, bullish yeah, yeah, is yes. leading it. He's yeah. volunteering. It. He's volunteering. He's been voluntold. <laughs> yeah, yeah, step up. Um, so, yeah, is it going to be, I mean, yeah, there's this, this stuff going on with the SEC. Let's hope that goes well. Um, you know, once, once we get past that, the great thing being is there's been so much over the past six months, so much going on in the XRP community. I mean, you just see these meetups here and the number of people that are coming along to them. Um, that's going to accelerate even further. Uh, there's the XRP Ledger Grants program. We've had like I think a hundred, over a hundred applications to this Wave Two. We had over a hundred for Wave One. So there's a lot of people like wanting to build stuff on the XRP Ledger. So yeah, I think I think there is. I think it's it's looking good. Uh, awesome. All right. And then one one other question. I think you might have answered this one uh, from Adam uh, Sigmund. He said, uh, uh, let's see. Uh, oh, here a potential solution about uh, regarding the trust line issues on the XRPL. So, yeah, so the trust line issues are basically the, the load that's on the XRP ledger. A lot of it's come about by people creating vast numbers of these trust line objects. Um, but the XRP ledger it wasn't a use case that was ever kind of envisaged. Um, there's several 
several prongs to deal with that. One is um, making the queuing algorithm work a bit better, which is what they're working on at the moment as kind of a quick fix. Then longer term, so there's some software being worked on called Project Clio. Um, I did a, I do a, a, a Twitch stream every Tuesday, and I had this, this Tuesday a colleague of mine, CJ Cobb, on talking about this thing called Project Clio. Uh, Project Clio is a, a separate bit of software that sits next to the XRP Ledger software, and it's more efficient at storing the historical data. And it stores it in about a quarter of the space needed. And so it makes it a lot more efficient for people to run nodes that have the full history in, in the XRP Ledger. And that's partly the problem with a lot of these trust lines being created is that the, the total size of the data in the XRP Ledger has doubled in the past few months. And with that doubling, that means that whenever a new node comes on board, it has to, to basically synchronize twice the amount of data. And this is, um, you know, if it's storing historical information, it has to store twice the amount of data. So that's just becoming huge. Um, and Project Clio is a, is a way to address that. And so that's going to be, um, again, hopefully coming in next year. I think uh, Ripple were, you know, kicking the tires on it at the moment um, and uh, testing it. It was, it was showcased at Apex and uh, CJ did a thing on, on, on Twitch. If you go, actually, that was one of the things I missed off where to get help. Uh, Twitch.tv slash RippleXDev. Um, I run a weekly Twitch show on, on a Tuesday. So I'm going to wrap it up here because I think we're going out of time and I'm getting money. Another beer, I'm running out of voice. So, uh, <laughs> thank you. Everybody. Yeah, one last round of applause for Matt Hamilton, everybody. <laughs> so, if you have any more questions, uh, I think we have the space, you know, they, they'll let us stay here for a little while longer. So, yeah. please uh, ask questions. If you have uh, more questions, if you're tuning in online, uh, please join our Discord. What's what's the name of the server? Uh, uh, I can't remember off the top of my head. There was a QR code. Uh, we'll, we'll 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 get those links out there. And yeah, please please post your uh, your questions on there, and uh, let's let's keep the momentum going. I want a group photo. Yeah, let's do a group photo. All right, let's do a group photo. Yeah, first ever XRP yeah. meetup in Miami. Let's do it. Yeah. Let's put the. Uh... Oh yeah. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Don't forget to like and subscribe.